Hello and welcome to the Tyler and Josh Show today. We're talking about movies, because that's what we do on the show. We talk about movies and happiness and how our beards keep growing because we're too lazy to shave them. Anyway, how are you today, Tyler? Well, first of all, I am not too lazy to shave. I just oh, okay. don't want to fucking do it. It's I'm too lazy. been a few years. I trim. Oh, that's trim is matter. good. It, it's yeah. a very impressive beard. Mine just grows out awkwardly, so... I figured this was a good intro to the show you, to talk about dude, facial you'd have, hair. You'd have to let it grow out for it to get out of uh, out of funk, but... I don't, I don't grow here, just here, so it looks like I have those Elvis sideburns going on. It's really awkward. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Uh, anyway, what's going on? What, 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 what's, what's happening? Uh, how's the couch? Uh, that wall. Well, there's a ton of shit on here that I should have cleared up, but not that people can see it. And one of these days, I'm actually going to put posters behind that wall because a birthday present that my parents promised me was uh, being able to frame one of the posters that you guys, uh, that I bought off of you guys. Oh, so nice. that'll be very Yeah, that, that'd be awesome. That, framing is a little expensive, so I completely understand, but it'll look great yeah, when which, you do um, it. Which one they offered, I thought that would be pretty cool. And the other one is Take for it. a silk poster of a certain Disney Channel cartoon that I will be doing a video essay of in Ooh. the coming weeks. Is it DuckTales right. season whatever? Season three, the final season, and basically how some of my favorite characters have started off and how they've progressed to become just so damn likable and relatable, even though they're ducks that walk around with no pants, let alone no underwear. That is uh, that is a true fact. Ducks are why don't naked we just add in that? Why don't we just add that to the list of shit that should be canceled for absolutely no reason? Those kids are not wearing pants. How dare they? Yeah, you got to wear ducks. pants. And and they can't wear skirts because that's femaleist or something. I don't know. You well, know. a couple of them do, but that's a completely different story. Anyway, today we're talking about uh, properties, true life stories, adoption, memoirs, anything we think should be adapted into a feature film, put on the screen, potentially win an Oscar. Um, this was a very hard list for me to do. Um, really? I knew there were things I wanted adapted, but my brain was like, no. No, no, I can't tell you what they are. Um, I sat around since 8 a.m. this morning, um, because we record this in the morning to put it up on Friday, um, thinking about this. And then I finally, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the thing I want the movie of. Uh, yeah, you know so. what? Um, as I was going through these, I was kind of amazed that some of them haven't been turned into, like, live-action TV shows or movies, because... Some of them have similar franchises that have been adapted. I can see why some of these haven't been adaptable because in some cases there isn't really that much action going on. It's a little more suspenseful or character driven. There's some that have certain taboo subjects that people just don't want to talk about nowadays, which is all the more reason why they should be adapted in my professional opinion. Well, yeah, there's a few of these on my list that um, you may not think, oh, I want to see that on the screen, but some of these, there's one, there's one that we will get to, oh my goodness, it needs to be a film. And I will explain why. Um, but honorable mention wise, I would love to see um, the 1942 novel, Freddy Goes to Florida, adapted to the screen. It's a series of eight to ten novels from the 1940s and 50s about a pig and his farm animals who go on adventures, like a precursor to Babe. Um, Farmer Joe really? is the guy, and they go to Florida, and they say, it's really fun and quirky. It's nothing, but it would make a great kids, franch a great kids franchise. Um, the sequel to Gone with the Wind, um, whether you believe in that movie or not, Scarlett O'Hara is a fascinating book if you get a chance to read it. I think it would make a... It, follows Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind in her later life. And I'd also like to see my favorite psychedelic band of all time get a biopic. I'd like to see a biopic, a real live uh, a, a retelling of how Nectar started in 1965 and then created Journey to the Center of the Eye, recycled Taboo, uh, and all these various weird, interesting psych albums. Now, Tyler, I know you're not familiar with Nectar, but... They're a jazz infusion, psych rock, guitar, melodic, um, sort of uh, Jethro Tull vibe without the flute. Um, oh. So they're like very that. nice. They're very, um, they have very, very interesting lyrics. Um, they, they do a whole album, and uh, one of my favorite lyrics of them is Take my name, play, take my face, it won't be long till you crucify me. And they're talking, 
about about I don't know what they're talking about, but it's freaking sweet. They're Canadian. I think we need a Nectar doc because I actually love Nectar. Their 2020 album from last year um, is absolutely phenomenal, and I'd love to see a documentary or a biopic done on these guys. But this was a tough list for me. What do you got for honorable mentions? I actually don't have a ton of honorable mentions. I have two that are life stories because for this list, I tried to focus more on fictional works that haven't been adapted yet. And when I was compiling this list, my family even went to me and went, oh, really? These books and shows haven't been remade and ripped off yet? And I'm just like, weirdly enough, no. But there are a couple of true life stories that I think would make really impactful films. The first one, everyone complained about Bohemian Rhapsody being a very pedestrian biopic. And that's because, well, it was. It had great music, but it's Queen. It was going to have great music. Oh, Queen music is great. Queen is probably the second greatest band of all time. But I would love to see a biopic about how the Queen members that are still in the band, Brian and Roger, going on tours with Paul Rogers and Adam Lambert kind of going back and forth Mm. between the two timelines to see what works with Adam Lambert now and what didn't really work with Paul Rogers. And that's just, this is really from a personal opinion base because I've heard Paul Rogers sing Queen stuff and he is a great singer, but he has more of a bluesy voice that doesn't always mesh with some of the songs. And people who love Paul Rogers and Queen really just hate Adam Lambert as a singer. So it's kind of a biased fan base, if I'm being honest. I and really Adam like Lambert, Adam Lambert. His solo music is incredible. Um, I own all yeah, like, albums. He's amazing. Yeah, like Lambert's stuff is a little more electronic for my Mm. taste but i do acknowledge that they're really good songs but what makes him such a good front man alongside queen because he's not a member of queen it's queen plus adam lambert Mm -hmm. they're making it abundantly clear that nobody could replace freddie which i think would be a great reason to tell the story where it's just like it's not really replacing freddie that's the point it's to find an excuse just to perform the music that we grew passionate about the music that we treat as if it was our own children type of thing. In fact, in some cases, songs were inspired by their own children. Radio Gaga was based on something the drummer's son would say over and over again as a little kid. So the, yeah, I'd watch that. the little I'd things watch that you come up with. So. Yeah, like the little things you come up with. And this next one is a really, really hot button, but I still think it would be, I still think it would be a really good movie or miniseries. There's this true life man named Daryl Davis. He's a jazz musician. He toured with Mm. B.B. King among uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, tons of other musicians. But he also um, goes to KKK rallies because he is a black man from the South. And he has directly or indirectly encouraged 200 people to leave. I mean, really? Like, it's, in my opinion, would be the the one movie that in my opinion, it would be the one movie that could actually examine where racism comes from, because that's why he does it. He wants to learn where the hatred comes from so that it can be conquered. There's one um, there's one really good anecdote where he actually bailed one of these guys out of jail and took him on a trip to the Naf- National African American History Museum. And long story short, afterwards, the guy asked Daryl Davis to hand his daughter off at the wedding. Like that's the impact that he has on these guys. And it's a really good example of compassion and forgiveness that is desperately needed in these times. If we want to get along, we have to understand where the conflict is coming from. He has a really good Joe Rogan episode where he kind of explains just how fucked up the recruiting process is. Some of the more, some of the more glossed over history, like what the uh, center, the, the Center for Right Alley in Charleston, the actual motivation behind it, some certain hypocrisies that should be obvious, but we don't actually know about them, and just so many other details that people are so afraid to address nowadays, which in my opinion is what's really holding us back. And I feel like telling this story, it's so it sounds so far-fetched, but that's actually what kind of makes sense about it. And in my opinion, that's just one of many reasons that it would be definitely an unforgettable movie that goes without saying and i have no idea looking at your face how impressed or just um, confused i my are. brain is contemplating this and wondering why i have never heard about this in any history class or any story or anything because that that's a fascinating that is that 
I Daryl, would watch that yeah. movie. That that would yeah. be that could be they could have some really great comedy moments. That could have some really great drama moments. It could be There are there are definitely great everything. examples. There are examples where you can make dark comedy out of it. He um another anecdote of him is a conversation where one of the clans member goes, Oh, well, you guys have this gene that makes you all violent. And it's just like, oh yeah, well, white people have this gene that makes them serial killers. Name three black serial killers for me. And the guy just couldn't do it. And he's just like, what you just said is stupid. It's no more stupid than what you just told me. And the guy backed off. Man, like, I, I can I be see really this funny. Movie. Tyler, go go tell Hollywood to make this movie and make it. I will. Make I them will. make it. I want to see it. That'd be great. Any other honorable mentions there on your list? Um, No, that's actually where it stops. Because I didn't try to think too hard about what hasn't been adapted. Because there are mm. some ideas that I've heard of that could be great movies. But I haven't actually read the source material yet. And if you're listening, Hollywood make original films people want original films original stories original directors different points of view don't make the same shit you've been making for 50 years do new things new Please. things it's not about the money it's about the creativity well we need money to make original movies so yes, unfortunately and if you make a really great original part. movie it's there the money's there because people go and see a really great original movie. We need to be stop being mindless robot slaves seeing the next Transformers at the movie theater over Pop Star Never Stop Stopping. Because uh, that movie should have got a lot. That was much more original than that film. Anyway, um, do you want to start today or should I start today? It, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know what? I'm I'm good. What whatever whichever works for you. All right, I'll just <clears throat> jump into it. Um, I rank these. Uh, again, there's no particular order, but I put these in order for the sake of the video for our top six. Yeah, same. Uh, my top six is I want to see Wonder Woman Land of the Scales, Scaled Gods. This is issue 256 from 1980. And the plot goes as follows. It is awesome. I read this as a child, and I've always wanted this in my life. Um, I always enjoyed the Wonder Woman show going up. Wonder Woman was that fun show where she talked to animals and had the magic lasso. And yes, Linda, and it was cheesy. It was 100% cheesy. And there was the 79 movie, which was very cheesy. Um, but this is Diana Prince and fellow astronauts. They're on a space mission, but they're brought down by aliens. And they crash in a hidden valley in the USA full of dinosaurs. I want Wonder Woman versus a freaking T-Rex like the cover promised me. They crash. They don't know where they are. And then they have to fight freaking dinosaurs. That's what I want out of a Wonder Woman movie. Um, now, you're probably wondering, how do you make this a full feature? Now, my thought is you could introduce another villain in there who's controlling the dinosaurs. I'm okay with that. You could have a whole bunch of dinosaurs that are mind-controlled that talk. I don't care what you do. I want Wonder Woman versus freaking dinosaurs because it is the most badass comic I have ever read. I don't read a lot of comics, but as a kid, I would get comics. And this is the one that I picked up at a thrift store for like a buck. I'm like, oh, it's Wonder Woman. Then I go home and I keep reading this thing. Because Wonder Woman is kicking a T-Rex's ass and beating the crap out of this thing. And then becomes friends with it. It's the best. Um, now, the astronaut crew there... We have a few, we have a casualty of an astronaut crew, and we got a big old crew of three, and I think they're trying to do a mission to Mars or the moon or something, if I remember right, to, because the U.S. was obsessed with space forever. That's just how the U.S. is. But um, I want, this is my movie. So first of all, I want it to be, I want this to be a fun movie. I want it to be really, really, really fun. Like, just a fun, straight-up popcorn flick, but I don't want no bad director in here. I want, I want, I want Dennis Delaneuve to jump in and make this movie. As silly as this sounds. Now, I want the dinosaurs to be mind-controlled by whatever villain we got. There's a million villains in the comic book who could mind-control. And she basically has to overcome this villain and their army of dinosaurs. Now, the astronauts? Now, I'm thinking we need to reach into a little bit of alien resurrection here. And we need to grab My Michael Fassbender because he'd make a great astronaut. I want to grab I want to grab Daniel Craig in here because you know Cowboys versus Aliens or whatever I really like that movie it's super fun it's great it's pulp I want to introduce a small village of like prehistoric people that live in this sort of bubble that no one can get to this isolated area that have to help them fight back against the dinosaurs you know they can dig trenches they can have big fights and the big final scene 
this is how it ends, Tyler. This is where the money shot is. This is the trailer shot. You see Wonder Woman finally breaking these dinosaurs, and their will is not to eat her or fight. They just want to live in peace because they're freaking dinosaurs. You know, she makes friends with the Stegosaurus early long, but the end, that T-Rex she's kicking the ass out of with the lasso of truth, they finally come to an understanding. She gets on the back of that fucking T-Rex, and she rides that thing and eats the villain in one smooth gobble and winks at the camera. Make this a DC animated movie. Make this live action. Make this thing for me. I want Wonder Woman versus dinosaurs. Really bad. Really, really bad. I like it. You know lot. what? That would make a really good solo DC animated movie because yeah, part of the yeah. charm of their animated yeah. universe is that not only will they go all the way in terms of sex, profanity, and the level of violence that they have. They're not as concerned with continuity. That's not to say that there isn't, but it's always been very, it's always been as loose as a comic book continuity to begin with. So yeah, I definitely think it would be a little bit more well-suited for that. But once you said Wonder Woman fighting dinosaurs, yeah. supposedly in like the prehistoric era, I started thinking of like, a minimalist survival movie which would be I'm something brand too. new yeah it would be something brand new for a superhero movie and part of what makes the dc eu right now so special is that they're focusing more on individual solo movies that are kind of more going by basic genres as opposed to just being a science fantasy epic movie i mean the reason i love birds of prey is that it's really an r-rated martial arts movie that's told yeah. in the vein of a superhero movie and with Shazam, there's like a good Christmas coming of age thing going on, which is what makes it far so charming. And I feel like with this one, as you were describing it, it reminded me of this um, Adult Swim cartoon called Primal, which is made by the mm. uh, Samurai Jack guy. And the big twist is like Samurai Jack, it's told with little to no dialogue whatsoever. And it's really just about a caveman and a T-Rex learning to get along and surviving in the prehistoric landscape. So I'm already really getting some good vibes on how minimalist, but still simple. It could be a prehistoric dinosaur version of Mad Max Fury Road. Oh Constantly yes, please. Tons of action and the survival lends itself to the character development. This could be really awesome. She punches a pterodactyl on the cover. <laughs> of course she does. And then rides the darn thing after the Oh, uh, I just, I, this was my favorite comic as a kid, and I just want anything. I'll take anything with Wonder Woman versus Dinosaurs. So, <clears throat> anyway, what you got at number six? Mine is a silly number six, so. <laughs> my number six is not silly, thankfully. It is actually a memoir okay. by Augustine Burroughs, who is most famous for basically writing memoirs, his first one being Running with Scissors. And this was actually his second book that chronicles a 10 year point of recovery from alcoholism, the personal setbacks that led him to relapse, and then basically the key motivators that have led him to be the clean and sober man that he is to this day. And if you've ever read any of his books, especially Running With Scissors or Dry, you know that what makes Burroughs such a clever writer is that he has absolutely no filter in his subject matter whatsoever because he had a pretty dark and fucked up life. And what's so great about his books is that he is able to make light of just how shitty of a circumstance he was in. Not just for the sake of entertaining people by writing into it as a book, but more as a form of therapy. He has flat out said that writing his first book was what motivated him to drink less and less. And according mm -hmm. to him, he hadn't laughed in years until he had written something down that he thought was funny. And it just motivated him to keep going. And in my opinion, that would be a great true life story because so many true life stories that um, revolve around alcoholism, drug abuse, and recovery, stuff like say, uh, Beautiful Boy, or mm. I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of some other ones, but uh, Beautiful Boy is the prime example that comes up to mind. The That's the one where Timothy, Steve Carell is that the Steve the Steve Carell Timothy Timothy Chalamet one. Yeah, that's the one with Steve Carell and there Timothy was Chalamet, with, and that is there was that is a really great name. movie. What's that? There was another one. Something about Ben. Uh, Julia oh, Roberts. Oh, Ben is back? Ben is yeah, back. There ben was that back. one too, I didn't I see that one. It's all right. Boy Races. Uh, sorry. Beautiful Boy is better. Boy Race is a different movie. Which is pretty good. I prefer um, um, the one with Cameron Post. Cameron Post, I know. Yeah. But um, anyways, movies like Beautiful Boy, whenever there's a story about alcoholism or drug abuse nowadays, it's mainly a story about how 
other people are basically forced to offer assistance to those who are in need of recovery, which don't get me wrong, is definitely a great message. But I feel like we need more true life stories about how important it is to reach out and ask for assistance from others and be unafraid to do so repeatedly because that's a process that he he and many other alcoholics have to go through in order to stay so sober and stay alive. This book reminded me so much of um, this really awesome miniseries called Patrick Melrose with Benedict Cumberbatch, which is hands down one of the best pieces of television I have ever seen. I hate the fact that very few people have watched it, but it's yeah, a Showtime really series. So not that many people watch Showtime, which is a really shitty thing in and of itself. But um, yeah, in Patrick Melrose, it's basically the same thing. He's an alcoholic. We do see like flashbacks of what led to that abuse, what he's like as a recovered man, what he's like as a relapsed man. And then the final episode is basically him having to choose one or the other to stay sober or drown his sorrows and mm. be in complete denial of his pain. And as much as we sympathize him with him for the pain that he has gone through, it doesn't change the fact that if he doesn't reach out to other people, they can't they can't psychically guess what you're going through or how they can help. And chances are, if you're an ugly drunk, they're not going to want to help you regardless of how bad your childhood is because you're handling the situation so poorly. Dry is a book that is very uncompromising in its message that as important as it is to have people to support you, you have to reach out in order to get support in the first place. And it's a message that I see less and less in books and movies and TV shows. It's one of the reasons I actually do like DuckTales as a kid's show is that because it's letting kids know asking for help is basically the only way that you can move forward and take charge of your own life. You have to ask help in order to gain control over things. This sounds very, very interesting. Um, maybe it's a little bit too close to home, but... Uh... <laughs> Um, that would absolutely be a fascinating story, but a crushing one, a crushing, fascinating story. Um, well, I mean, spoiler alert, there is a happy ending, but it's just such an uncompromising message that's told in an entertaining and uplifting fashion. And the mm. weird thing is people tend to forget you can tell really dark stories in an uplifting fashion. And that is kind of what he does with this. Sometimes he changes names in order to like maintain people's privacies. There's one there's one death of a man with uh, HIV that he was mm -hmm. very close to, but he calls him Pighead, which may or may not be like him calling himself Pighead because he was really a shitty boyfriend to that one guy because Augustine Burroughs is gay. And mm -hmm. part of the uh, story is that he's sent to a rehab center specifically for uh, gay patients, which That's I find a little oh, counter reductive. Okay especially considering no. one of them is a sex addict. So one of his fellow patients is a sex addict. So mm. not sure that that was a great idea, but um, that's a completely different story in and of itself. Give this to a director like Chloe Zhao. I started watching Nomadland last night. So, You know what? I would love if she could tell uh, this story. I um, feel like she could tell this story really good. <laughs> yeah, but like About Augustine Burroughs has only, Augustine Burroughs has only had one adaptation before, which is Running With Scissors because it's his most popular book. But it was adapted by uh, Ryan Murphy before he made uh, Glee. Mm. So, as okay, it's it's an okay movie. Like it has really good performances from Alec Baldwin, Annette Bening, Joseph Cross, Evan Rachel Wood. Gwyneth Paltrow is ungodly annoying, but that is kind of the point. So for once, you can actually be okay with it. But it still has a lot of Ryan Murphy's tropes. It has incredibly pretentious dialogue. Really an excessive amount of narration as per usual. And as a lot of people have complained, there are some scenes that kind of glorify mental illness. I wouldn't change it either way because the movie does leave it up to you to decide whether or not the people in this are upstanding or not. But there are some times where you're wondering what exactly is the point of some of these really strange and stupid scenarios? Like they apparently ask God a question and it's just like, should we have fish sticks for dinner? plops their finger on okay. a random page, looks at the word, it's just like awakening, as in awakening of taste buds. Super. God wants to have fish sticks. Unless they used it as a moment of comedy or something. They were trying to be funny. No, no, no. It was a moment of comedy, but it's just like, was this an actual thing? Are people really this stupid? I don't know. Uh, you'd have to ask the people in real life, which I actually don't know. 
Well, a couple of them are dead, and the ones that were alive ended up suing him because allegedly it was fake, but um, I doubt it. Yeah, I would I would totally watch that. I mean, you just get, get me that movie. Yeah, I'll pop it on my TV or streaming or whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of a writer or director, but you know what? I can see Chloe Zhao doing a really good job with that. Mm. Yeah, I just feel because I'm 20. I was, I was watching Nomadland last night, you know, so. Watching or watching? Well, you know, I, I couldn't get it through normal processes okay <laughs> so you know i wanted to try to get it but yeah uh, then i fell asleep uh so, um yeah I, I like the pick i mean i always like a good um uh, sort of uh comeback story you know for something yeah, like that absolutely well my number five is i'm fascinated with this subject and you're gonna be like of course he is of course josh is fascinated with this um so i read this book in high school and I actually own a copy, The Anthrax Letters, a medical detective story. So if you're not familiar with anthrax, there's a major anthrax, anthrax scares after 9-11. After Basically, they were right. sending anthrax around, and it killed, I think, about 12 people. Now, uh, do you know what anthrax does? In a sense. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really bad. It basically turns all your internal organs to blood. So basically, the way they laid out this book is like a crime story where they're giving you the facts and they're breaking down each event and which little pieces led to where we got today. And this would this movie would take place from October 2nd to 2001 to 2011 to the finale of the lawsuit. And it would basically track um, Stephen Hatfall, the person who was distributing anthrax and got it on the black market and such, and basically tell this interesting, quirky story. But here's the thing. What he did was bad, obviously. I'm just going to say that now so you don't get mad at me. Obviously. I want to do it in a big short style. So it's not just information, information, information. I want you have the celebrity cameos or the moments of humor or just these people basically expressing themselves in the most odd way to create sort of moments of that these people are very human and we're not just giving you information about people dying. And I think it could be a very, very, very interesting piece. Um... And then you could do you could do chapters, you could do you could do pages, but the book itself is very informative, but does have some fun moments because they include the moments between the FBI and the CIA and just quirky phrases they would say to each other and such. And I think this could be a very effective adaption, not only historically accurate as well, because I don't think anyone's made an Anthrax movie. Um, I don't know if there's a demand for this, but I'm fascinated by the subject. Um, I just think right now with all the COVID and the airborne diseases and stuff, I just think there's a there's a very interest in you can't make you can't make a COVID movie yet, obviously, but you could make well, an anthrax movie. I mean, they've made COVID movies, unfortunately. Like, but not about COVID. No, they have. When did they do this? <laughs> so Michael Bay produced this really shitty thing called Songbird that takes place in uh, 2023 or 2024 or something like that. Okay. It has a lot of really talented people like Taylor Kitsch, Bradley Whitford, um, Catherine Keener. I've I've heard nothing but really terrible things about it. Not necessarily Never because it was it. too soon, but because the production quality just wasn't that good. There's one that takes place in an elevator that is done in, to look like it's one take where everyone's trapped in an elevator and there's the COVID's going around, but there's a Chinese girl. So there's a little bit of a racist okay. allegory there. Yeah. And um, it doesn't help that one of the members in the elevator has a swastika tattooed on his forehead. So we all know mm. where that's going. And um, never heard of this. And of course, some life. stupid, <laughs> some stupid cheap exploitation ones like COVID zombies where you just roll your eyes and go, really? Yeah, that's fair. It's it's fucking pathetic, but no. But I, I do think that the anthrax letters could be a really interesting dive into a piece of history that we don't really know a lot about. There haven't been a ton of books written. It's not a major topic that you know they talked about outside of the news and whether people thought it was fake or not. But this was a real health scare. You know, this was a huge deal. Not many people died, but like anthrax is bad, guys. It's really bad, and it's it's a it's a chemical weapon, um, a breathing weapon. Um, it, it, and I just think it'd be very timely and very interesting to make a movie like this, sort of to draw comparisons to our current scenario 
and it, it would not it wouldn't have to focus completely on the American war on terror because it wasn't really centered around that. It was just someone basically taking the opportunity to do that who may or may have not ties because they never confirmed to any terrorist organization. Um, it's just a person being a terrible person, basically. But I think it'd be even if they did a true crime, <coughs> like the 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 true crime things they do on Netflix, the three or four episodes, fascinating. I would watch it. Um, I think Steven Soderbergh would nail this. Well, of course he said Steve Steven Soderbergh on this yeah. one. I mean, when this shit hit, everybody was watching Contagion, and I'm like, you fucking idiots! You were making yourselves even more fucking scared than you should be. Congratulations. No but, one was um, watching Quarantine. Okay, no one was watching Quarantine. Come on. Wait, is Quarantine the wreck knockoff? It's sort of. <laughs> but it, it's all but about like, quarantine because of the deadly virus. That's the idea. Yeah, but like when it comes to Anthrax, the most I've ever seen were two Criminal Minds episodes mm. about it, but that was really it. Yeah, there was a scare at the White House, and there was a scare at uh, a couple news organizations and such. And it was, it was very interesting. It's sort of like it's not huge scale as you think it would be. It was still a major yeah. threat, obviously, but it's sort of like a small-scale terrorist threat, and I, I find that very interesting if you were to adapt that to screen. So, yeah, okay. Um, I the Anthrax letters, I would watch that. Anyway, what well, you got at number five? Something more positive. My number I hope. five. My number five was something I thought about after I discovered that a show I used to watch on TV with my sister called The Winx Club has actually been adapted by Netflix into kind of this R-rated version of a CW fantasy show, mm -hmm. and I just sat there and I'm like, The Winx Club? Really? What is The Winx Club? It is an Italian cartoon about a group of girls who go to this boarding school for fairies, because that's basically what they are. And there are different oh, factions cool. within this world. There are fairies, there are witches, there's this all-guys boarding school where they're like knights or whatever, and the big thing with this... Yeah, um, the big thing with this Netflix version was that... Um, They've kind of switched things around to adapt with the times. Like guys and girls can be fairies, guys and girls can be knights. And I just sat there. I'm like, okay, that that part does make a lot more sense. But it's another. It's a CW show, just R rated. It speaks for itself on just how lame the subject material is. And also, they turned the main character into Elsa for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Like it, from Frozen. Uh, yeah, like the okay. not being able to control your powers, and she has like flame powers and apparently set her mom on fire to be fair that's, that's what rogue my... from x-men if you want to be technical she there's that too like much, so. i don't know it's based on what my sister told me because she hate watches the show kind of like how she used to hate watch uh riverdale <laughs> oh my wife loves that show i'm glad she likes it i can't stand it but uh, anyways number five reminded me of just how many shows and movies i grew up loving that have been in that are just remembered nowadays for being the worst adaptations in history. This year we had Tom and Jerry. No real surprise that it sucked. Did you I'm not holding my yet? breath. No, but like based on what everybody's telling me, it kind of goes without saying anyways. I mean, I'll watch it. I but, like Tom and Jerry. I like their home movie. But yeah, Tom and Jerry bombed. I'm not holding my breath for Clifford the Big Red Dog this November. And I found out that the oh, director of... Yeah, exactly. I found out the director of Tom and Jerry this year, Tim Story is going to butcher, oh, sorry, adapt uh, Corduroy Bear. I like Corduroy Bear. I like that book. I but there's put that on my list. But there's, like, nothing there. There's, like, barely any story. You could adapt the cartoon from the 90s, and you still wouldn't have enough to make into I mean, a movie. Plus, there's more material in here on the Purple Crayon. I don't even want to get into like the stuff about supposedly product placements because it would probably take place in a mall or seeing Corduroy fart out his uh, felt or whatever. That's just shit that really comes into mind. But then I discovered something, a TV show that I hadn't, that I grew up with that hadn't been adapted. And it's just like, you know what? I think you could actually do it without butchering it. And that is a cartoon very similar to the vein of Winx Club and Totally Spies, Martin Mystery which I had a really good time watching as a kid. For those who don't know, it um, don't. it's a very eclectic mix of Scooby-Doo, The X-Files, and Men in Black. Because huh. Martin Mystery is a 16-year-old kid from Quebec. He, his stepsister Diana, a caveman named Java, and a tiny green alien named Billy all work for this group called The Center, where their boss, whose codename is M-O-M, that's her acronym, so everybody calls her mom. <laughs> they go 
across the globe to solve these supernatural mysteries, but they have yeah. sci-fi gadgets that can help them along the way. The big thing is that Martin has this watch called the U watch that can teleport uh, gadgets and weapons whenever they need to. So he'll click the button and it'll go, you watch activated, slime scanner selected, and it'll teleport. And yeah, like, as you can tell, this already has, like I just mentioned, an eclectic mix of Scooby-Doo, Men in Black, and uh, X-Files. But in my opinion, all those familiar ingredients combined with the familiar character tropes can actually make for something really entertaining and self-referential, given the fact that it is pretty dated down to the fact that Martin Mystery that's his fucking last name. In fact, it could, if you were to adapt this, that could turn into a code name where it's just like Martin Mystery from the center and everyone's just like, yeah, and I'm Speedy Gonzalez, get lost, asshole. But <laughs> that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But as familiar as everything is, with the self-referential humor, like making fun of his name, making fun of the fact that whenever they're at school or whenever they're not at the center, but they're called to do so, there's like this portal that they can track through mm. their watch in just about anywhere, any door, any cupboard, even behind a statue. There's some jokes where it's just like, how is it so convenient that they know exactly where we're standing in? And then all of a sudden they'll be teleported to the center which they'll immediately go from the center to this one location where you instantly go from America to somewhere like Spain, England, or France within a split second, which can instantly solve the uh, traveling montages that you see in every movie like Men in Black or so. It has the, it has very imaginative supernatural scenarios. I rewatched a couple episodes just to remind myself how campy, but also kind of dark it is because even though it is technically a lighthearted comedy, they still dabble with different genres like science fiction, fantasy, even horror. For me, the hmm. darkest episode growing up was this two-parter where everyone was disappearing because they were being devoured by their own shadows and taken into the shadow realm. And the longer they stay in that realm, the longer they become permanently shadows. And long story short, Martin becomes the last person on hmm. Earth for this two-parter. And I even rewatched the first episode just to remind myself what it was like. And um, long story short, they had to defeat a boogeyman that was abducting naughty children. And this boogeyman had like not only a decent amount of long legs, a decent amount of eyes all over its face, but could transform from one world to another by turning into a pile of maggots. It can go places okay. with the dark imagery, and that's where the X-Files aspect of it comes in, because it starts off like every other X-Files episode where it builds up the mystery, it builds up the tension. You hear a scream and a character just goes, what's going on? Freeze frame and the narrator goes, this week on Martin Mystery, attack of the whatever. So mm. imagine if a movie started off like that nowadays, adding to the self-referential campy vibe, but at the center of it all, with all of these imaginative scenarios, you still have incredibly familiar, but still likable characters. Martin is the hyperactive nerd slash loser who still has a heart of gold. He's incredibly cocky, but that's mostly because he's incredibly good at his job and he's incredibly passionate about it. His stepsister is, first of all, like step siblings is a dynamic you don't see very often in movies nowadays. And in the cartoon, she was incredibly whiny and kind of useless. So now's a good opportunity to kind of elevate her as a character. Mm. Having a walking, talking caveman like Java can lend to so many cool uh, comedic scenarios. Like one second he will go, Java, do this and that. And then all of a sudden when he knocks on the door, he's just like, hi, I'm from this place and I need, in I need you to uh, step outside for me to examine this. And all the characters can just go. And then afterwards he's just like, Java rehearsing for several weeks. Java very good in impersonation. And it's just like, that'd be comedic gold. I would love that stuff. And Can even with John the tiny Cena? green alien, I imagine Dave Bautista because Ooh, in, like um, yeah, mostly yeah. because in the, mostly because in the cartoon, he had like, he had, he, he wasn't white. That was, that's my best way of describing it. They don't make it clear where exactly in the prehistoric world he was from, but mm -hmm. that part is made abundantly clear. And even with the tiny green alien, he has this um, fake bodysuit that makes him look like a 14 year old boy. So he can actually go on adventures and once mm -hmm. in a while actually does. And I don't actually have that many like directors or writers in mind for some of the choices on my list, but I would love if either Taika Waititi Taika Waititi was the first selection that comes up to mind because yeah. he can do 
these fantasy horror comedy scenarios with such likable outsider characters. It's right up his realm. He's used to working with younger actors, so that's not going to be a problem. Plus, working with teenagers would be a fresh change of pace for him, too. Taika Waititi is the first thing that comes to mind because he can do action, horror, and comedy all at once with a specific budget in mind. So for me, that's the first selection that mm, I right. can think of. And you know what? I'm going to settle with that because it just sounds like so that. nice. Yeah, I had, an I had another director in mind, but I can't think of them right now. Was it James Gunn? No, although that would have been interesting too. Or um, Christopher Columbus? I mean, Taika Waititi is this generation's Chris Columbus. You know what? Actually, my favorite choice here would be Sam Raimi. Maybe. Because I like Sam Raimi. But, oh, I, I mean, uh, I can't believe Taika oh. Waititi hasn't made a kid's movie yet. I was oh. going to think... I, I, I was also going to say uh, Robert Rodriguez because he has that, oh, like, yeah. childlike imagination. This would be a great chance for him to go into, like, darker territory. And if you give him half the budget he had for Battle Angel, I feel like he can accomplish you seamless no enough money. effects. Robert Rodriguez makes something for nothing. Yeah, but, like, I want to see him make more movies like Battle Angel where he has tools at hand. Yeah, I would I would totally watch this, especially if you put Taika Waititi there. Uh, I'm I'm 100% in. Uh, coming into my number four, I have a children's property, one that I am very fond of, um, that never got adapted. They keep remaking the original over and over again, but they can't seem to make the sequel. Uh, so, uh, I think it was '68 that it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the book, or whatever. They made made it made Charlie so, and yeah. the Charlie and the Fo Chocolate Factory the, 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 in the Either book. the 60s or the 70s. Yeah. So in 1972, they made a sequel that picks up exactly where the other one left off. Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. But they never have ever adapted it. They keep making the original over and over again. And it may be because the sequel's a little weird. The sequel's really weird. I'm surprised Tim Burton hasn't touched this. Like, this is perfect for him. Uh, so the elevator launches out of the factory at the end of the movie, if you're not aware, and the end of the book. And he launches into space. And he says he's won. And they go to check in at a hotel because that's his prize in short. And the hotel is run by the, the Vinicius Knips, who he mentions in the movie. The Vinicius Knips are a race of aliens that are assassins. And they're out to kill the president. So they quarantine the hotel when the president shows up. Because everyone could travel to space. Didn't you know? Um, you're... Um, they're like a squid-like alien, I think, um, if I remember right. And they kidnap the president. And Charlie and Willy Wonka and Grandpa Joe have to save the president from the Vinicius Knits. Then they land back on Earth, and something has gone wrong. Grandpa Joe and Georgina and all the ones who didn't go in the Great Gas Elevator have got a hold of Wonkavite or Vitawonk, which basically reverses or adds years to your life. So, and here's where it gets awesome and weird. This is a cool book. Um... Grandpa Georgina has drank too much Wonka Vite, Vite, which has made her negative two, so they have to enter the spirit realm to recover her soul and give her Vita Wonk, which will age her back to her normal age, and then have president with then have lunch with the president to thank him for saving him from the viciousness vicious Knits. Um, are you following? And why is Not Burton really, not... but keep going anyway. That's the plot, um, in a nutshell. It's this strange, bizarre thing with Willy Wonka. Um, Tim Burton should have made this one instead of the original. This is so Tim Burton-y. He literally gets to, like, have a curious case of Benjamin Button mixed with White House down on the moon and squids. That's, it's, it's so strange. Um, maybe they haven't adapted it because it's weird and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um... But, I, I mean, they adapted The Witches by Raoul Dahl, and Raoul Dahl wrote You Only Live Twice. I mean, they got that on screen. But, like, they haven't adapted George's Marvelous Medicine yet, and that makes me a little upset, you know? But, like, I want Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. I love this book. It's fun. It's weird. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's quirky. And it's... They're singing, too. They're singing. Um, there's a song, a uh, little song that he sings as they're beating up the Vinicius Knits and there's laser battles and they get to go around this hotel and they have weird like space age elevators and I'm like I want this this is the world all adoption we need 
Uh, thoughts? Just when I thought the B, just when I thought the BFG was as weird of a Raw Doll adaptation no. as you could possibly get, which don't get me, <coughs> <coughs> which don't get me wrong, I like the BFG. It's one of the few Spielberg movies in the past few years that I've actually enjoyed. Mm. Although I did enjoy the first half more because it was so mystical and magical. And then once they get to the Queen of England shit, I just sat there and I'm like, was this in the book? Because this seems like such a deviation. And it turns out. It was in the book, and they deviated a lot from that uh, actual plot line because they knew how fucking stupid it was. So, but yeah, that um, that does have Tim Burton's fingerprints all yeah. over it. I can't believe it. Wow. It sounds like I, I feel I feel like the reason it hasn't been made is they're not happy with the Raoul Doll adaptions, the estate, so they're restricting anyone from making them. <coughs> because I mean, they did they made they literally made two adaptions. Um, they made like chocolate factory and then they made matilda in the 90s and the witches and then after that you know they really haven't made anything since so i feel like the estate is like no no we probably shouldn't let you make things um yeah well i don't know i mean the witches was last year they they had no problem with wes anderson doing fantastic mr fox oh, to the point true. where it's a fucking criterion which is weird because criterion mm. does not like to acknowledge animation all that much for some reason no <laughs> uh, but, maybe my um, life as a zucchini yeah. is on criterion i don't know um <laughs> i've checked but either way i think this is like the perfect strange oddball kids movie that tim burton could make i think it's so tim burtony it doesn't you don't even have to try that hard you could literally adapt it oh. straight from the book um have you seen the second alice in wonderland through the looking glass that is a weird movie um it's not as weird as this uh, so, um, give me Tim, I, now I never say it, I'm not a Tim Burton fan, but Tim Burton would nail this. Um, straight up. That's very, that's very high praise. I'm not a huge Tim Burton guy either, but, um, well, yeah, I mean, for the looking glass, isn't actually him. It was, uh, James Bobin who made oh. the Muppets, but, uh, well, I am wrong. <clears throat> but it might as well have been made by Burton because it has his fingerprints all over it anyways. But no, I, I think this would be just such a strange oddball adaption. And it was one of my favorite books as a kid besides George's Marvelous Medicine. If you haven't read that book, it's where this character, George, finds out his mother is sick, takes all the things in his kitchen, puts them in a pot, and makes it and cures her. It's incredibly dumb. Um, he puts, like, bleach in there and everything under the sun. Uh, and, like, oatmeal mixed with, like, fairy dust. It's really strange, man. There's some weird books out there. Wow. <laughs> I was mesmerized by it. And there's a story to go with it. I thought that since George's Marvelous Medicine was the greatest thing I'd ever read at like six years old, I literally went and tried to make my own thing, and I literally combined like, I think, olive oil with oatmeal and oregano, and like combined all these edible things, no toxic chemicals, and tried to eat it and vomit it. Because <laughs> I was just so much like, this. it has to be real, you know? It was not. Um, don't do that. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that's my number. That's my number four. I'm glad there were no toxic chemicals because that yeah, was I where I thought you were going with that. My story. mom was supervising. She didn't let me do that. Okay. Wanted to grab I, dish soap. She said, well, no. as long as you say that now. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, I guess this is important prefix or whatever. <laughs> okay. So, uh, my number four is a YA franchise that actually hasn't been turned into movies yet. Okay. But it actually... It actually does kind of make sense because in my opinion, they would work best as a series of suspenseful thrillers that are character pieces as mm. opposed to an action YA franchise, which is really what sells or what did sell during the YA craze. Because even though there are technically, <clears throat> even though there are technically violent rebellions in these YA book series to the point where it's handled so gritty and realistic. You wonder why they let any kids actually read them in the first place. I discovered these books because the first one was read as part of a grade six class and everybody liked it so much that everyone in my grade started checking out those books from the library and we got hooked on it. We fell in mm. love with just how realistic the mythology, the characters and the themes of how the government tends to overreact from things like overpopulation environmental issues and famine to the point where they become incredibly dictator-like and corrupt where only the wealthy can rise above them the wealthy in these are called barons and this is a franchise called uh it's called the shadow children's series every book starts off with the title among the like among the hidden among hmm. the imposters 
and it takes place in a world. They don't specify what timeline or what country this takes place in. It could really take place anywhere because it's kind of a metaphor of China's one child policy and kind of how authoritative that is. But it takes place in a world where you're only allowed to have two children. And if you have more than two children, they have to be hidden within their home from the rest of society because if they're found out, it's either a $50 million fine or an execution from the population police who are basically who are basically the Gestapo, SS, Third Reich, you name it. They're okay. that authoritarian. Huh. And what's interesting is that the first two books start off from the perspective of this one kid named Luke. And worst case scenario, he has to stay hidden within his house for the rest of his life. There were times where he was allowed to like venture out into their farm because that's what they were. But because of gentrification and having to build houses on their property, he has to stay hidden. So he passes time by spying on the neighbors and discovers there's a third child within that rich kid's house. So he goes to that house, breaks in, and they become friends. And he starts to learn a lot more about the Mm. world through this one girl named Jen, because long story short, because her family's rich, she's been able to venture out under the disguise as their niece or something Mm. like that. And from then on, it becomes a series of thrillers that are told not from the perspective of the people who actually lead the rebellion like Cadmus in the Hunger Games. It's more about the middlemen, the people who are caught in the crossfire or just surviving until the world changes enough that they can venture out and become their own free and independent people. But the reason they're still heroes and the reason you still like them as characters is because they do have a stake in fighting in these rebellions. They are responsible for providing for children with fake IDs so they can venture around the world and go to school because boarding schools have become a safe haven for children like this because the school masters are just so sick of these rules. And for the first two books, it follows Luke. But then afterwards, they start to venture off where side characters that he's come across become main characters, different uh, girls that he's um, become friends with, friends of theirs who have become like a little more higher up in the food chain with fighting against the population police by infiltrating them. It becomes very agoraphobic once they venture out into the real world and they have absolutely no idea how to survive. All they know is if they don't try, they're going to die either way to being very claustrophobic when they're just running out of shit to do, running out of options because they have absolutely no other friends and family to help them outside of the ones that they grew up with. There are so many huge opportunities that I think you can make with a franchise like this, whether it be a movie franchise or even a TV show, because I can see this being Mm. adapted into a really good TV show because they're kids books. They have maybe like 200 pages tops, so you can actually add some stuff in that would still suit the material very nicely. And I would just love a franchise that would actually doesn't have to rely on other franchises to be interconnected, to have movies told from different characters' points of view. It could be one franchise, but the main characters, the main narrative is constantly shifting. There are so many, there are a few books where Luke is actually a side character or is just one book in in, in particular where he's not even in it, he's just mentioned and that's it. Mm. That's the amount of impact that he has from the lessons that he's learned from this one girl, Jen, that he's passing on to her children, even though he's not leading the rebellion, he's making a huge difference. And plus, I just want to see a YA franchise that would have more of a Hitchcockian Mm. narrative where the action isn't really like through fist fights, it's through the information that they're discovering Mm. and not knowing who to trust and who's against them because there are some villains within the population police that they have crossed paths with who present themselves as for children, but they're actually just spies trying to rat people out and such. There are so many, I'm gonna say this again, I keep repeating myself, I keep stuttering in this video, but like there are so many opportunities and it is easy to butcher, which is probably a good reason why it hasn't been made yet, but I still feel like there's some potential. Wes Ball, who directed the uh, Maze Runner trilogy, was really good at handling suspense, not through action, but through running and chase sequences. And there are some moments where that could actually lend to the suspense and tension within the story. So I would love to see Hmm. him direct something like this. This sounds very, very interesting. It's like a World War II thriller almost, but set in modern day, really, so. 
it has a modern day feel. Like I said, it's not so specific to be a little bit more ambiguous. And I feel like you can actually accomplish that in the way that mm. they, um, in the way they made Man with the High Castle. I don't know if you've heard of I've that heard show. I've heard of it. Uh, I haven't watched it, but I've heard of it. I think you mentioned it. I feel like this could be that type of franchise. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds really, really interesting. Um, I like the idea of the characters not having to be the same in every movie. Just have a different sort of lead and have a switch around and stuff that'd be very fascinating yeah i don't know if i like any young adult franchises gonna be honest um i don't mind the hunger games the first couple ones like the first two i like to a certain extent you know um the maze runner was a thing right yeah and you know what like once in a happened. while once in a while like um maze runner was above average it was really when they started in throwing in like twists and ya cliches that it got really out of hand like if they were if they were survival thrillers like the shadow children franchise is mm -hmm. but the difference is maze runner had like special effects cgi creatures which west yeah. ball can handle because he used to be a visual effects artist that was still kind of in his wheelhouse and that was kind of what made maze runner the above average YA franchise out of all of them for me personally mm. anyways that was yeah, there was Don O'Brien was a good main lead his series of unfortunate events young adult I would think so yeah I mean they were okay I, I I can't think of one I love people really like the Barry Sonnenfeld Netflix version of a series of unfortunate events I watched it I didn't mind it um I guess I guess the probably the closest people would come to young adults is Umbrella Academy at this point um I don't like know if that closest. counts, but... I don't know if it does, but if it is, it's sort of within that realm. Um, yeah, um, yeah, very interesting pick. I have a very... Um, I, I was listening to um, O oh Sleeper, and they wrote this song, and I said, well, now I've got to go discover the true story behind that. And they have never... Na okay, it's, it's a metal band, so I'll say. Um, right. So this is... This, I don't know if you know the story of the 1907 Nayara attack. No. <clears throat> so this is, this is part of the Israel and Palestinian, on, Palestinian ongoing war. So basically in 1979, a 16-year-old Samir Kuton took a boat across to Lebanon and killed and murdered a family um, in cold and brutal blood, and only the mother survived. Hmm. So... Um, he was part of the Palestinian uh, Liberation Front, and they never, Palestinian, Israeli, there's a lot of war over there. So basically, took a boat, went across there, and he goes to this, to this uh, medium-ranking military officer's house, and he basically shoots the entire house up, kidnaps the father, shoots him in the back, bashes in the little girl's skull, and while the mother hides the daughter in the attic, to keep her from screaming and being quiet so they're not seeing, the mother suffocates her own daughter. And he eventually, they, they eventually get stopped and everyone but this, but Samir um, Kutar, who survived and went to jail for many years but was traded as a political prisoner many years later. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think this story, and this is, this is how I want to paint it, because it is obviously a very, very dark story. So we have three set pieces. We have the house, we have the neighbor's house, we have, and then the beach and the time leading up to it. I really want to focus on the family. I think you get a really great Israeli director on there um, or a Lebanon director, someone who definitely sympathizes with it to tell this really sort of heartbreaking sort of um, Schindler's List style, like bad shit happened sort of story. And I do think we do sort of one of those things, like a timeline where it says like 2.28 p.m. and it shows them at the market or they're coming from school or where they're going. And then you just break down this heartbreaking action as this, this father tries to protect his children and this mother suffocates her own child in an attic. And I just think this would be an incredible story. You can read into it a lot more. I'm just really going over the vague details here. But I think I think this would make a great film. Um, is it tragic? A hundred percent. But is it a great true story? Darn if I ever heard one it is. Um, should have happened? No. Um, and um, yeah, because there's a... Oh, I, I grabbed the, the Oh Sleeper album last year, the 2019 release of uh, uh, Children, whatever it is. But there's a song called Hush Yale, and they tell this story through a metal song. And it's... Um, uh, it's... It's heartbreaking. Um, I think this is sort of like your um, 
your Argos or your Schindler's Lists or your um, any of these true life stories or your Tor Tor Torres or your Attack on Pearl Harbor sort of vibe, but a lot more tragic, if you know what I mean. Um, what do you think? Um, it was <laughs> the kid was Yale. The kid <clears throat> that suffocated was Yale. So I think you call it Hush Yale, and that's a great foul title for the movie. It would be a very haunting title, that's yeah. for sure. And um, when you do say should it have happened, no, that's all the more reason to tell the story. Yeah. That one this of the reasons to story. share true life stories in art is to uh, show why things that shouldn't have happened do. That's like the f that's the first and only thing that really comes to mind when I hear this story because it just sounds so it does sound incredibly fucked up and there are fictional war movies that have kind of reminded me of this exact one my folks uh, told me about this I know it sounds like a horrible segue but they told me about <laughs> this uh, I'm not kidding a thriller movie starring Owen Wilson called No Escape Oh, that's got uh, Pierce Brosnan in I watched that in theaters. I am so sorry, but... Uh, it exists. Yeah, and Pierce Brosnan was probably the only good thing about No Escape. Uh, Pierce Brosnan is great. I like that man. Um, but yeah, I just think this could be such a real, impactful, real-life story. You started off with like the following events are true, because I never heard this story before. And I thought, why have I never heard this story? This is a story that we should tell. Yeah, when you this talk about the timeline, the impact of it. When you talk about the timeline, I can imagine building up the family first as like yes. your average everyday family and mm -hmm. the relationships that come from it, and then focusing on the attackers and how they were planning, why they planned this to begin with, mm -hmm. and then start lead off into the infiltration. So like now you know everything about these characters, which is what makes it incredibly more suspenseful. Because mm -hmm. if it just started off like. 10 minutes of the family and then the rest of the movie is the attack it's not going to have no, enough merit no, to it whatsoever it's kind of like um it's kind of like hotel mumbai where they have all of those mm, characters built film. up and then they start off with the attackers or kind of like patriot's day where they do the mm -hmm. exact same thing with the real yep. life subjects or that's exactly what i characters because mark Wahlberg is like three or four people shoved into one but but I, what i like about patriot's day or um, Deepwater Horizon or any of those types of movies the way they structure them is they always have that one survivor who offers hope to others and that's exactly what I want to do with the mother figure from this story so um, yeah um, really dark and subject Peter Berg, matter, but yeah. and Peter, Peter Berg would be oh a good choice if I'm being honest I have watched a lot of Peter Berg's movies I really like the way he makes his films he knows exactly what he's doing I like his true life stories when um, when he does stuff like Spencer Confidential or uh, Mile 22. I don't know what he was thinking on those. Mile 22. Have I seen that? I don't know. That's the I've one with really uh, watched, Wahlberg uh... and Eco Ues. Oh, okay, I like that movie. I didn't mind it. Yeah. I liked it. He could he could have helped the camera still. But yeah, I, I would just love, and I do think it'd be really cool to see life as an average day as in Lebanon. I think that'd be a really interesting perspective to see. You know, and I think you make it in the language that they speak, in Arabic. You make it with Arabic, straight up. And you make it, good. you make and it like, a foreign film. You make it exactly and make it represent. That's what I want. That's what I want out of this. So yeah, um, do like Clint yeah. Eastwood did with Letters from Iwo Jima or mm -hmm. Mel Gibson with Apocalypto, because mm -hmm. yeah, there are directors willing to make movies in a language that's not theirs. But even in a foreign language, this is a heartbreaking film. Uh, oh, one hundred percent. I'm surprised they haven't adapted it. Um, anyway, um, what's your number three? Hopefully it's more positive. It is incredible. Well, it is technically more positive, but Just a little um, bit is it's, okay. It's a little bit of a dark comedy mixed in with some fantasy in a way that you would not expect. This is an anime that in our very first video ever, I said that my dream project for Quentin Tarantino, my favorite director was to adapt this anime that basically feels like a love letter to his filmmaking and his style because it really does have all of his fingerprints where it's told in a non-linear fashion there are a ton of colorful characters none of which are like a straightforward hero they're all anti-heroes it takes place in the prohibition half of them are mm. mobsters so there's already plenty of opportunities for the the, the massive amount of over-the-top violence that he is known for, and believe me, they take 
absolutely no punches whatsoever. But the twist is half of these characters are immortal. This is a movie, this is an anime called um, Bacchano about a group of crime families, alchemists, and this incredibly hilarious romantic pair of thieves who all cross paths, paths once they discover this elixir that grants immortality towards anyone who drinks it. And long story short, there are a couple of rules that can cause an immortal person to die that I don't want to spoil. But what's very unique about these characters is that if they're immortal, if they get shot or stabbed, they're uh, everything that they've lost, their blood, their limbs, bone, marrow, tissue, immediately like flies right back onto them and reattaches in a split second. It's not like Wolverine where like new stuff just grows back in its place. It comes right back at them as if it were a magnet, which was so, which is so cool. And it's something that I can imagine Tarantino doing in a practical way without CGI. Whenever someone gets shot or stabbed, you can just film it from a close up and all the blood shoots out in reverse. So he can like edit it back in and it can still look incredibly seamless or as seamless as possible. I get the feeling that for the immortality deaths, because long story short, if any other live action director were to do this, it would have to be in CGI. I feel like he would redo how that person would die in order to suit his old style fashion, but it has the amount of over the top violence. It has the nonlinear fashion, but it also has so many incredibly likable characters that I can imagine Hollywood actors filling these parts seamlessly. In fact, on on Twitter five years ago, I actually had my own uh, Twitter fan cast where it's just like, okay, I would love if Taron Edgerton were this guy. I would love Jacob Tremblay to be the one kid. Mm. Evan Peters from X-Men would look incredibly slimy and sadistic as this one killer. There are so many, it's such an accessible anime that, which is exactly why I think it would make such a great adaptation, but for one, it is incredibly violent, maybe a little more so than some Tarantino movies, because one of the kids, the main kid in this is immortal, but he goes through a lot of violent, quote unquote, deaths, and he can still feel the pain. So there's a little bit of insecurity with him that humanizes him, despite the fact that he really has no stakes whatsoever. He still has something in his heart that he feels he can lose. The two romantic thieves who cross paths with every character, regardless of whether or not they're friends with them or not, Isaac and Miria, are so hilarious in their stupidity. Like their opening scene is them receiving a letter from their friend who's basically describing how lonely she is. And they read between the lines, it's just just like, I've got it. She just wants a little brother or something like that. Well, we can't exactly buy her a baby brother. Yes, that's true. Instead, we should buy her something expensive and bring it to New York. Well, how are we going to do that? We don't have enough money to buy a non-expensive gift. Then we're just going to have to commit a train robbery. Oh, that's a great idea. Hmm. Wait, it's been a few years. Let me see if I can do this. First, we get on the train. Yes, and then we get off and do the robbery. And then we get back and leave. And it's just like, that's how fucking stupid they are. But they're so energetic Uh... and compassionate, despite the fact that they steal. Hell, there's one bit where they're sitting on like the roof of a house they're about to steal, but there's like a little orphan girl because her parents are dead and her older brother's in charge. And they're like commenting about how sad she is without even talking to her. They're dressed like Native Americans with a headdress and pouring sand on the ground. And it's just like, what is going on in your head? Like they're so random, but you're so curious about what their thought process is. And that's what makes them in my opinion, two of the most likable characters I've ever seen in an anime. And I feel like Tarantino is the only one who can make them so colorful and likable, despite the fact that they are incredibly offside. I can see Bruce Campbell being Isaac and Amy Poehler being Maria. It's such an, it's such an out of place. It's such an out of place combination, which is in my (laughs) opinion, what makes it work so well. I want to see Amy Poehler and Bruce Campbell in a movie together. I know they got some more evil dead thing they're announcing. Put Amy Poehler in that. Let's see what happens. Really? I don't know. They said something about Evil Dead Rises. I don't know if it's happening or announced or if it's a game or a TV. I don't know. But they want to do more. That's what I know. Because money. Um, yeah. I would like watch this. this. Sounds weird. I'm in. This sounds more like a mini series as opposed to a movie, given the fact that the show itself was based off of three light novels that were all like its singular story. And the show kind of goes back and forth from 
the central story about how the mobsters and the alchemists like met mm -hmm. up. There's another one about a group of non-immortal criminals who are like trying to basically commit a massacre or a kidnapping on this one train, which I'm not kidding, is called the plot the flying pussyfoot. And weirdly enough, nobody points out just how stupid of a name that is because prohibition. And then there's one episode that's just a flashback to how the alchemists came up with the immortal elixir and kind of how they split up and became enemies within themselves. Because some of these alchemists are actually in the mafia and are already immortal, but they're trying to get the elixir out of the way mm. because immortality can be a curse more so than a blessing. But Needless to say, there are some people who found the blessing in it, namely some of these gangsters. I can imagine Joseph Gordon-Levitt being one of the crime mm. bosses because one of the crime bosses is like the youngest member who's also the smartest and most suave. And I feel like Gordon-Levitt has that ability and he has that like thick Italian accent he did with Don John. I think he can apply that in a much more serious way. Plus, he would have to be best friends with the character I think Taron Edgerton would fit in perfectly, this like um, muscle man who's trying to be made, but he's so sophisticated and calm, even though he's dirt poor. And that's the other thing, like most Quentin Tarantino characters, whether they're rich or poor, they're charismatic and suave, no matter how many people they kill. You know who would be a great director for this? Paul Verhoeven, he, is, he loves blood. This is this is too sophisticated for his standards, in my opinion. I can see um, Starship Troopers if not for Tarantino, is a very sophisticated can... film. Yeah, whatever. I love um, that. Other than Tarantino, I can imagine either Guy Ritchie or uh, Antoine Fuqua, the guy mm, who directed uh, Magnif Fuqua. the Magnificent Seven remake. And because uh, Equalizer, like he has Equalizer. Yeah, because like he also has an old fashioned style, especially with Magnificent Seven, that reminds you of fifties and sixties movies. But he's still able to blend that in with like modern characters and dialogue. So, mm -hmm. any of those three directors, I can imagine this doing a fantastic job at revitalizing mob crime movies because they're really lacking nowadays. We don't have a lot of them. Something killed the crime genre, and I don't know what it is. It could have been a lot of things, but it's not gaudy. Uh, no, um, not gaudy at all. My number two is I. This is one of my favorite video games, and I've always wanted to see an adaptation of it because there's literally like so many adaptions of video games, but no one can bother to get around to secure the rights to Perfect Dark. And I know you're not a gamer, so basically, uh, Joanna Dark works at the Carrington Institute for Research, and it, they investigate extraterrestrials, conspiracies. And they, they have a rival portion named Datadyne. And the whole, the, the, it's a very simple story. Basically, she's working there, she's doing her day-to-day -day thing, and everything goes wrong, and she has to save this unwittingly gray-looking alien that looks exactly like the alien from American Dad, but with doesn't talk. Um, and she gets to go through these, these big, big levels of fighting down buildings and running around and shooting things. She has a she has an array of these elaborate weapons from a standard sp pistol that looks space age to like an evaporator gun and it's just it's a really cool sci-fi game. The f the big finale takes place in this like alien temple where a bunch of these you have to defeat the aliens and such because apparently he was a traitor and all the other aliens are coming down to murder this one and the US government has been experimenting on it. It sounds generic, but the levels the characters are phenomenal. Um, have you ever heard of Perfect Dark, Tyler? Okay. Um, it's a rare game, if it helps. Uh, they made GoldenEye. This is considered a spiritual successor to GoldenEye. It's very much in the same vein of the gameplay. But it has a phenomenal story. And it takes you... It's almost like sci-fi James Bond. Because it takes Joanna Dark basically through the government labs, through these big set pieces. There's a couple action set pieces in here as well to a big villa, to a giant pyramid like they did in Moonraker and such. And it's just, I feel like this could be a film just waiting to happen. Obviously, you're going to need to write in some scenes and some filler and stuff because the N64 did not have cutscenes. Um, and you can draw inspiration from the launch title for the Xbox 360, Perfect Dark Zero. And you definitely can use the song Faces in the Limelight from the club scene because uh, that's a stupid song and I really want to uh, hand my ringtone for a little while. Now, my pick to play Joanna Dark 
is Ruby Rose. I know there's a lot of stuff going around, but she would nail this role. It's it's she looks exactly like Joanna Dark without trying. <laughs> so um, yes, um, perfect dark alien sci-fi thriller. I think you'd get to know the alien along the way. It'd be a less silly version of Paul. I think it'd be really really great because it's 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 a small it's a two person buddy cop basically point A to point B. It's a giant escort mission. It's a buddy cop thing. So you could have Roger the Alien for all I care. But I want them to adapt Perfect Dark because I really like this game. And I like the level design and I like the gameplay and I like running around. Just the little things in this game add to make this world. When you're fighting in the villa, you can you can break the bottles of wine. And this in you know, that's really cool. You can you can interact with some of the other characters in the lab and such, and the technology is is really, really neat. You can get costumes for your alien in this freaking game. I love it. You can make him dress up in like a American red, white, and blue pajama onesie and run around the labs. It's it's phenomenal. <laughs> and then it's got multiplayer. I just feel like this this concept has so much potential. Do not let Paul W. Anderson handle it, or whoever made Resident Evil. Don't let him anywhere near it. Give this to some up-and-coming director, someone who loves the franchise, um, and make this a really cool buddy cop with an alien type movie. That's what I want from a Perfect Dark film. Yeah, as long as it's not Paul W.S. Anderson or Uva Bull, I think it would be a safe enough choice. You uh, you had me in an alien that uh, looked like Roger, which makes me wonder what would Seth MacFarlane do if he did a video game adaptation, because because honestly, that Paul Lind impression as Roger is really what makes the character, and I can... I can imagine that being funny, even though people wouldn't understand the reference on that. <clears throat> and for that matter, I like Paul. It's not that silly. It is, it is a silly movie, but it is fun. I like that we get Simon Pegg and Nick Frost together. I think that was the last time we saw them really in a movie together, so... It was one of the last times. It wasn't the last, thankfully. Was it Was it <clears throat> World's End or whatever? Was that the last one? So. I mean, I like Paul better than World's End, but I, I do like them together, so... Really? Huh. Yeah, World's End is just... I don't know. It didn't do much for me. Um, That's I really like Todd Fuzz, and I still... I, I watched Shaun of the Dead the other day. It doesn't hold up as much as I'd like, but it's still got some really great moments, and it's a solid flick. It's a lot darker than I remembered. I remembered it being funnier. Um, it wasn't as funny as I thought. Yeah, but, like, that's that's the cool thing about it, is that as much as it makes fun of zombie movies, it still fits the formula pretty well. <clears throat> But that's yeah. just my take on it. Yeah, I, I, I like it. But I want to see another Alien movie. I like Alien movies. It's good stuff. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, I, I just think there's not enough fun sci-fi out there, and I think it'd be really fun with some great action sequences. Um, what's your number two, Tyler? We're getting down to the, uh, down to the end. Well, my top two... My top two are Broadway musicals that you would swear had not made it onto Broadway just because of how aggressively offside and just downright offensive the humor is within these circumstances mm -hmm. let alone the fact that they would get adapted as to movies the only way i can see these being adapted was if they were on a streaming service so that audience members had a little bit more free will and whether or not they would get to watch it or not mm -hmm. but <clears throat> i still feel as if there is hope because both of these picks won the tony for best musical and yet everyone's saying you can't make a movie based on just how offside everything is well if the most uptight of broadway nerds can appreciate the hell out of these then there is hope and my number two is a musical from trey parker matt stone and disney songwriter robert lopez the book of mormon oh i know this yeah yeah i know this. i saw this four years ago my dad bought me tickets for center in the square as a christmas present and my God was the crowd on fire laughing their asses off at just how absurd fucking everything is. And if it's the fall, if it's the usual like uh, Broadway musical thing where the first half has a lot of really catchy and energetic songs, and then the second half is a little more story oriented, but the second half also had the moments that had my jaw on the floor the entire time. There's a musical number where the main character has the hell dream where he dreams that he's like being punished eternally and he's alongside Genghis Khan, Hitler, Johnny Cochran because defending OJ gets you in the hell. <laughs> 
God. <laughs> and that's just one that's just one of many things. There's an entire performance of like Mormon converts in front of like the apostles that was so was so horrible and involves dancing around with a five foot dildo that I kept looking at the ground half the time because I just could not believe what the fuck was going on. Sounds like Trey Parker for sure. Oh, it has Parker and Stone's uh, humor and messages every single second of this musical, which is just absolutely insane. I haven't gotten to the story yet for obvious reasons, but... Yeah. Oh my god. So basically, it's about two Mormons who have recently become elders, and they're sent off to Uganda to preach the faith. And of course, what they realize because of their ignorance and just because of how much um, just how much their beliefs in religion in general have been spoon fed to them by like the higher ups of the religion as well as their parents that the people of Uganda are going through a hell of a lot of worse things than a crisis of faith. There is poverty, war, famine. Half of the village that they go to has AIDS, which, um, yeah, that's Parker and Stone too. Yeah, which, 100%. Um, I haven't even gotten to the fact that the villain of this uh, show is the warlord who goes by the name of General Butt-Fucking-Naked, which I found out there actually was a general who went by Butt-Naked, uh... not for the exact same reasons, at least I hope. But um, yeah, needless to say, the musical numbers, whenever they randomly break out into song and dance, it's actually, it either takes your mind just to, off of how fucked up the material is, or just emphasizes how inconsistent and stupid the main characters and their beliefs are, especially two songs in particular. One is called Hasadiga Ibowai, which is the standout song of the show where the villagers basically sing about how they feel towards religion and God in ways that the missionaries would not want to hear or turn it off when they get to their dorm room of other missionaries and they discover that their higher ups have a lot of repression and like turning it off is just taking your mind off of just how fucked up your childhood was, but also explaining why they believe in religion so much they feel as if it has healed them as people and that's the really unique thing about this show parker and stone could have taken the easy way out of just criticizing the religion and its followers and nothing more but they made the wise decision to make every mormon in this movie very decent hearted and optimistic at best it's it's it just so happens that they have very self-centered or stupid desires that don't really con that don't really match up with what they've been told to believe or what they claim to believe half the time. The head elder of the story, played by Andrew Rannells, who was absolutely hilarious, his main thing of becoming a missionary was he wanted to be sent to Orlando, Florida, so he could go to Disney World, and then he gets sent to Uganda with Josh Gad, a pathological liar who didn't even read the Book of Mormon and somehow became an elder. And it comes to the point where Josh Gad is all by himself trying to preach the faith, and he starts making up shit using pop culture references in order to win over their approval. And he still goes along with it because he's making these people happy. He's uplifting their spirits during these really troubled times. And the show makes it clear, religion can be a good thing so long as you teach these lessons metaphorically as opposed to literally i know i know there are some viewers watching who are religious and might not take kindly to what i just said but that is just the opinion that parker and stone are going by they basically describe the show as a love letter to religion from an atheist perspective they know a lot of good can come from it they know there are a lot of fascinating aspects in life lessons it really just comes down to whether or not you believe in and how seriously you take it and that was that was what made it such a smart show in between just how crass the humor is to the point where I can't stop laughing about it. And based on everything that I've just said, it makes sense why no one would want to turn this into a movie because there are so many difficult subjects that people don't want to talk about. But as I said before, I think it's all the more reason to turn this into a movie just to make light of the taboo because after all, religion is in a way all about making light of the struggles that come with existence i'd like to take a moment to 
Robert Lopez, who's the Trey Parker, Matt Stone, and Robert Lopez created this. Just read he, off what other movies he's written for. Uh, Frozen. He's the Let It Go guy. Plus, he also yep. did the theme song, all the theme songs for the WandaVisions. He also wrote songs for the 2011 Winnie the Pooh. Yep, and Coco. And uh, the other Broadway musical, the one, my number one Broadway musical, he also wrote some of the songs too, and we'll get more into uh, those ones. But this is a fa- this man has had the most fascinating career. Um... <laughs> and he has, and he's an egot. He's just doing him. <laughs> yeah, which makes me feel so much better. But I'm yeah, like, Disney I... hired him. Like, how did well, Disney cause... hire this man? Well, because the general public doesn't know who he is. They don't know what he's responsible for. It's just so fascinating. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I like Team America World Police, so I'd probably like this, no questions asked. <laughs> and you know what? The sad thing is when I walk, when we walked out of the theater, there were Mormons outside trying to hand off the actual Book of Mormon. They're okay. just going around. They're, they're going around saying... This mo- this movie cha- this uh this story entertained you for two hours, but this will change your life. And I just mm-hmm. sat there. I'm like, fuck off. I'd like to celebrate my birthday. Thank you very much. Um. Anyway, um. Great pick for number number two there. I'm gonna jump into my number one. This has been this series has adapted the wrong versions, the other movies, different versions from time to time, but they have never done the one that I've wanted. I love the Chronicles of Narnia. I love the book series. I like C.S. Lewis. I like Lions and Adventure and, and I don't know, whatever. You know, I like magic wardrobes. But what they didn't do and what they have never adapted is the prequel book, The Magician's Nephew. I don't know if you've heard of this. I've heard of it, yeah. So The Magician's <clears throat> Nephew takes place before the events of The Lion, Rich, and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and all the other books. Now, this is the book that C.S. Lewis never meant to write, but he wrote it anyway, because they said what his inspiration for this was, what is the origin of the lampstand in Narnia? I always enjoyed Narnia. I've seen this movie 15 times in theaters for free because I kept knowing people who wanted to go. I love Narnia. I've read the books as a kid. These were the books that my dad read to me. You know, he's like, I'm going to read you Narnia because it's awesome. So this book was published in 1965, The Magician's Nephew. And it's, it's, it takes place with a couple kids, and we have Aunt Polly, the person who adopts them later on, in there. And these are her, her two kids. And there are five magic rings. And these five magic rings are all different teleportation devices. And Aunt Polly disappears with the yellow ring, jumping, jumping off there. And so they have to use the green rings, because they're just all hanging around the house, these magic rings. And they have basically have to go into the worlds of Narnia before we know it as Narnia and rescue their aunt and they have to go through all this and they have to battle Jadis who eventually becomes the white witch in Chronicles of Narnia as well as various giant statues talking animals you know the the Narnia fair but what makes this special is it doesn't just take place in Narnia now this is the last book he wrote in the series but it is the first one when they come back they rescue their aunt they come back they can use these things called portals with the rings. The rings create a portal that allow them to transport from time to time. Very Doctor Strange-like, if you know what I mean. But they have a giant freaking portal battle with the White Witch, giant statues, talking animals, and Aslan on the streets of British, on the streets of England. It's so freaking cool! That's... Why did they not do that? And they're like, there's animals jumping in and out of portals, and the White Witch is freezing strangers, and like... Aslan's got his little army, and they're fighting, and they're they're downtown. They they run past the the big old Big Ben and everything, and it's like this big epic battle of all these animals coming from different worlds to different points. It's like if Avengers Endgame did, if Chronicles of Narnia did Avengers Endgame with all its characters from the book series. Why in the hell have you not adapted this? Why did you not make this a movie, Disney? This is money in your freaking pocket. It's cool. It's so darn cool. The White Witch watching by and some guys commenting on her clothes and he freezes. She freezes him because she doesn't like the comment. That's a scene. That's funny. That's a Loki vibe. 
you've got yourself a Maleficent pre-story, something like that, where you make a, take one of the villains and you make it a very likable character. You put Tilda Swinton in this, she would destroy it as Jadis. You've got these two young kids, you've got magic, time-traveling, portal rings, you've got an infinite universe, you can spin this off into TV shows. This is a really cool book! This is my favorite of the books, and y'all have never done anything. It's also got this, it's also got the really interesting origin of, if you don't know the origin of the wardrobe, basically there's an apple that he took, and he plants a tree with his apple. This was an apple. Yeah, it was an apple, and he took it from a tree, and he planted it, and it grew into a tree which they made the chest out of, but the apple granted your heart's desires. So that's why they can go to Narnia. That's why they crave adventure. That's why they can go and experience this big darn adventure. That explains the Turkish light. That's the whole world of Narnia. Basically, your desires versus your needs. And this is a... It has, like... The book is, what, 250 pages, 220 pages or something? 45 of that is just the battle sequence in England. It's just... A giant battle sequence on the streets of England after they jump through portals. It's amazing. I want this. I want this really bad. Like, ever since I was a kid, I'm like, oh, you made the Chronicles of Narnia? I love that. You made Prince Caspian? I like Voyages of the Unshutter. Where is this one? Where is the magician's nephew? I want it. Really bad. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Well, you know what? If they were to reboot the series starting off with The Magician's Nephew, I can I'm see in. it kind of revitalizing the franchise based on what you just said. I felt like they started off with uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe kind of just to establish Narnia because I feel like if it you started off... Iconic. If you started off, like, establishing the franchise with an endgame battle in the streets of London, I feel like you'd be... I feel like you'd be starting off things off with a bang that can't be accomplished afterwards. Mm, cause... That's fair. Or Disney could just continue making the movies and get to The Magician's Nephew. There's only six books or something. Just well, get like, here's this the movie. thing. Here's the thing. Like, I remember how much everyone just went nuts with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, it's the only book in the franchise that I read from beginning to end. And don't get me wrong. I loved reading it. Nobody forced me to, but I did, which is the best uh, kind of book that you can read in school, which is the one that you chose to do. Yeah. But by the time Prince Caspian and Voyage of the Dawn Treader came out, everyone had already kind of gotten sick of it at that point. So I do feel like if they did Magician's Nephew before Prince Caspian, then maybe there would have been a, maybe there would have been a little bit more interest. I'm not entirely sure because people were pretty split on how good of an adaptation Prince Caspian was. I don't know that many people who liked Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Have you read depends. Voyage of the Dawn Treader? It's a I boat. Not. It's a it's a book describing a ship sailing around. Not much happens. You don't have a lot to adapt. So to be fair, they did the best they could with the material. Well, that plus the characters that I really liked, which were the older kids, they weren't actually in Voyage of the nope. Dawn Treader because I guess they were somehow too old to be in Narnia, which that rule I've never understood. But... It's, it happens... It's complicated. Then they can go back to it in later books. <laughs> but it yeah, doesn't make a whole lot of nephew, sense. The Magician's Nephew would be really awesome. And I've heard rumors that they want to restart the Narnia franchise with... Um, I think they wanted to restart it with the Silver Chair, but the Magician's Ooh. Nephew, I think, would have a lot more... Okay, the Silver Chair is a better book than Voyage of the Dawn Treader any day. It's better than Prince Caspian. It's a great, great book. It's like it's like a Game of Thrones for kids. It's super cool. About like yeah, like, like power struggles in a kingdom. I felt that about Narnia anyways. Yeah, but this one's like focuses on the politics of the kingdom. Hell, I mean Peter Dinklage is in Prince Caspian and he was one of the highlights. Mm, fair. I just want I more Narnia. That. That's what I want. Yeah. Hey, I want I, I want, hey, this I want one. it too. I like fantasy. I like but they keep giving me um I would have rather had Peter Jackson tackle um, Chronicles of Narnia as opposed to the Hobbit trilogy. I don't mind the Hobbit trilogy. I just think it's okay. Um, I like yeah. moments. It's okay. And I mean, the reason the reason Disney went with the Narnia franchise was because Lord of the Rings was such a huge mm -hmm. hit. So they went to C.S. Lewis adaptations, and because Narnia is, was such an easy thing for Disney to adapt, it really sold on it. But after after Return of the King. 
the fantasy genre kind of took a dive because everyone thought that was as good as it was going to get. And I feel like Prince Caspian kind of got caught in the middle of that. That's fair. Um, yeah, I mean, C.S. Lewis, I'd love an adaption of the screw tape letters. It's him talking to the devil. That's the whole book. It'd be fascinating. Really? It's wow. basically it's basically him questioning his fate versus the devil and having a moral conversation about it. It's one of those wow. fascinating uh -huh. reads. Um, whether you're religious or not, it's just him being like, well, what about this? And they're like, well, what about this? You know, it's like, makes you think. It's phenomenal. So, um, I mean, I would love to see if they did The Magician's Nephew. I would like to see Tilda Swinton come back as Jadis or the White Witch. She probably I, would, too. I would like Aslan to be Liam Neeson once again. Uh, for the kids, I don't know who you get. Get me some kids. For the aunt, I'm not picky. Um, we also have my favorite character. I wrote that down. Um, who's the character? Um, Fledge. He's a flying, talking horse. He's awesome. It's amazing. I want Mr. T as Fledge. No, just kidding. Uh, get get a good voice actor or something in there. <laughs> uh, but They'll yeah, get a, it's Disney. They'll get a celebrity or some shit like that. But yeah, no. Um, I think this could be really awesome. Um, oh, it totally you could could. build up to this, but you have to really make some good movies to get there. But if they can make Aladdin like. 72 and like lion king 12 and a half and and like cinderella 3 i don't even know why there needs to be a cinderella 3 or beauty and the beast and chant of christmas which is the same movie they just made an excerpt from it you can yeah, make those me were, this those one. were those movies were dirt cheap to make i know because half of them are half of them are vhs's in my fruit cellar right now <laughs> All I know is this would be a really great sort of payoff for all the crime. You could even, what you could do is you could run through the whole series again, continue the series as is, and then have the kids from that series in there instead of the ant's actual kids, and that would connect the tissue, and then have all these characters come back and, you know, time travel elements. I just want this. Maybe. This would be like, everyone fanboys out over something. I fanboy out of Chronicles of Narnia. No, it's, that's, it's that's totally thing. fair. Two, yeah. Uh, what's your number one? I'm very curious. You said Broadway musical. I want to know. I gotta know. I yes, gotta my know. number one is also a Tony Award winner for best musical, which you would not have guessed because it is actually an adult-oriented parody of Sesame Street, and it's called okay. Avenue Q. Oh, I have heard of this. Go on. So Avenue Q. It's so obvious of a Sesame Street parody to the point where you can point out who Ernie and Bert is. Here they're called um, Nikki and Rod. And if you're wondering if they carry over the gay rumors, they actually do have one of them being gay. And that's their central arc coming to terms with their sexuality and being open and honest about it. And they actually handle that despite being a parody of Sesame Street in a really good dramatic fashion that I'll get into later on. But um, yeah. You know who Ernie and Bert is. You know which puppet is like a combination of Cookie Monster and uh, Oscar because not only are they like the two-handed puppets, but they have very specific obsessions. Wait, does it have two heads? No, no. Oh, okay. I thought well, that would have been interesting. Because there's a two-headed monster in Sesame Street, so that's why I ask. Harry the two-headed really? monster? Yeah, he was... Anyway. I doesn't ring Sesame any bell. Um, anyway, continue. <laughs> But yeah, like the big twist of Avenue Q is that the puppeteers on stage are actually like in clear plain sight. They're wearing all black and all gray hmm. clothes, but they're saying and doing their lines with a visualized performance as much as it is a puppeteered performance. Meanwhile, the puppets and the human characters who are all mentor figures to the puppets are all in like very bright and vibrant and colorful costumes so that you're actually looking at the puppets, even though the puppeteers are in clear, plain sight. And it's actually a very seamless effect that most people wouldn't have even guessed. And I'll get into later on how I would address that in a live action movie, but it covers in the vein of Sesame Street, a lot of life lessons, but from an adult perspective, they cover stuff, like I said, about uh, homosexuality. They cover unemployment because Avenue Q is just such a dirt poor part of New York City. Mm. They address racism for one song, which is the hit song called Everyone's a Little Bit Racist. Oh, I've heard which, that. Um, which ties into the maybe this movie wouldn't be adapted type of thing. But I would argue this movie is actually against critiquing people based on their stereotypical behavior as opposed mm. to every single thing about them. There's a Japanese character in this 
called Christmas Eve with the most stereotypical accent you could possibly think of. But she's actually the smartest character in the entire show because she has two master's degrees in social work. She's an incredibly qualified therapist, but she has no clients. So she actually passes on free advice towards the other puppets about love and hate. And it actually, and they listen to her with so much respect and gratitude and look at her as a mentor. And that's what really makes her the smartest character in the entire show. And it's just such a great example of how not to critique people based on their stereotypes, just judge them as a whole. And I'm not kidding for one song, and this is my favorite song in the entire show. They talk about how the internet is for porn. In fact, that actually is the title of the song. And the first time I heard it, I was out of breath for five minutes. I could not believe how absurd it was. It's basically it's basically the R-rated version of C is for Cookie. That's basically what it is, because it's sung by the Cookie Monster and Oscar, um, which reminds me, as much as it, it, it's actually half C is for Cookie and half I Love My Trash, that's really where the parody comes in. And that's what makes the comedic aspect of it uh... so unique. But at its core... It actually does have some really good human character drama about how about what it really means to have meaning in life as weirdly as as weird as that sounds because the main character Princeton spends the entire musical wondering what his purpose in life actually is if he has one at all which leads him on a huge existential crisis that changes him and his other friends his love interest Kate Monster her purpose is to open up a school for other monster puppets because she's a kindergarten assistant teacher to uh, her headmaster, Mrs. Fizzletwat. I'm not making that up, I swear. Or, um, oh my I'm not even kidding. Even from the mentor's perspective, you have Christmas Eve's fiance, Brian, who wants to be a comedian, but his jokes just never land. And keeping up with the Sesame Street thing of having like a celebrity be part of the neighborhood, Gary Coleman is the Avenue Q superintendent. Gary and the whole Coleman. Yeah, they offered the role to him originally, but for whatever reason, he didn't show up to like the audition or the script read. So they instead hire, this is a trait with every production. They hire an average heighted black woman to play Gary Coleman. And weirdly enough, you don't actually pay attention to that. It's actually pretty seamless, and it's really hard to describe why, because technically on paper it makes no sense, but just seeing the actors on stage acting like Gary Coleman, complaining about the fact that they have already, that she's, that he's already achieved his purpose too early on to be a child star in the 80s, meanwhile his parents were skimming all of his money, even though he's still really bitter, he has one of the best songs about how we need to watch other people suffer as a necessity or even really as a benefit to our own lives. There's an entire song called Schadenfreude, which is basically German for happiness of the misfortune of others. And it's him singing about just how it's a part of life, whether we want it to be or not. And again, it's sung in such an uplifting fashion that you just can't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. There's so much thought into the drama and the comedy of what it means to be a kid in your early 20s venturing out into the open world being taught all this stuff about sesame street about what makes you special and then discovering that what was considered special when you were 10 isn't really the exact same thing in your 20s anymore um, now as for gary coleman we're thinking of the gary coleman from different strokes right yeah obviously okay um <laughs> i didn't know if there was another gary coleman i thought oh that's a random irrelevant celebrity <laughs> i i should also well because Again, like Gary Coleman achieved his purpose a little too early in life. And really, what did he do with his adult career afterwards? That was kind of the mentality that they were going for. But they were also celebrating the fact that even though he achieved his purpose a little too early, he still kept going. He didn't give up. And that was the that was the love of the character that unfortunately he didn't actually see in real life. And weirdly enough, um, even productions that went on after he died, they still kept the character and they did have to rewrite some lines because at one point he says like he's on an early track to the grave. They obviously rewrote mm. re that out for specific reasons. But I actually saw an interview of one of the actors who played Gary the night he died. She was terrified to go on stage because mm. I mean, really, what do you think yeah. people would say? But and the producers were very nice about it. It's just like, look, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. But 
eventually she said yes and when she does the introduction where it's just like oh my god it's gary coleman yes i am the crowd just went nuts it's like they needed <laughs> to see someone portray gary coleman in a positive fashion in order to be uplifted by such a tragedy so it's really weird how these things work now if people were to ask me how would you portray the puppets in a live action movie with a setting like this there are two ways you can do it you can do the stereotypical fashion of just having the puppets be on the ground with the puppeteers like standing on an extra set or something like that kind of like with a muppet movie mm -hmm. or <clears throat> You can actually keep the humans on screen with the puppets and supposedly let's suppose that the main characters were like in a mental institution as opposed to avenue q and the mentors were like mm. counselors or social workers mm. basically doing like drama therapy as a coping mechanism so the patients are like in on the joke but they're still acting this stuff out that would explain a lot it would add to the surrealism of just how stupid it is to see the puppet and the puppeteer on the same frame and then once they've all achieved the end of their arc, once they've achieved their goal, their purpose that they're trying to accomplish, they ditch the puppet and they start talking like themselves. Hmm. That's the main thing I would go for. I have no idea if it would work or not, but there's only one way to find out. Who would you have adapted out of curiosity? Um, writer, um, director, anyone, anyone you would want to attach to the project? You know what? If Parker and Stone were to adapt this in the same <laughs> way they adapted Team America, I'd be totally up for oh, it. Oh, yeah, that would work. Team America style with the marionettes. That'd be cool. Or um, even though Happy Time Murder sucked, I would love if uh, Brian whoa, Hansen would whoa. direct this because... It was a good movie. No, it wasn't. I enjoyed it immensely. Good for you. I didn't. Okay, well, we agree to disagree. But Brian Henson, yeah. But Brian Henson knows what he's doing with directing a movie or at least i think it was brian henson it was brian henson yes okay yeah so like he knows how to direct puppet work and thankfully with avenue q he doesn't really have to deviate that much from the source mm. material in order to get some offensive good humor out of it <clears throat> i like brian henson i don't think I, I think he did the best he could with the muppets there but then he's like no i don't got it so i'm just gonna do other things which is probably a smart choice <clears throat> but disney did worse so that's another video that, based on the conversation we had before making this one, we're uh, we're probably gonna have to get to that at some point. <clears throat> yeah, the Muppets is a, is one of my favorites. But um, yeah, I I have heard of this. I pulled up the I, I pulled up a YouTube link and added it to watch later for reasons. Um, I would like to watch it. So I've heard of it, but I never I saw it advertised like like everyone be like from the people who made Avenue Q. I'm like okay, didn't really think much about it at the time. So yeah. But yeah, good list, Tyler. Um, any surprises on my list for me? I wasn't expecting Magician's Nephew, but I really like that one. I, I <laughs> want I want a Chronicles of Narnia multiverse, really. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm after. Well, um, I mean, hey, yeah. seven plus books, it can happen. Yeah, I, I like that book series. But yeah, um, so what, what are you doing review-wise this week? What have you got reviews up for? I'm not actually sure review wise what I'm going to be up to because I I'm a little preoccupied with writing and composing clips for my DuckTales essay mm. as we speak because it's not a super time consuming process, but like it takes a couple days to get the whole thing accomplished. But by the time this airs, I would have been like in the final, I would have seen the final episode. I would have all my notes ready and I'll be about to kick things off, thankfully. But um, until then, I might have a review up for Anne at 13,000 Feet, which is a Canadian movie that TIFF has on their streaming service. Mm -hmm. I know I keep saying this, but one of these days, I either got to finish up my Studio Ghibli series because there's five or six movies I haven't reviewed yet, or, and I do have another, a new idea of reviewing movies on Disney Plus's star account that I really mm -hmm. love. And just flat out saying that these are technically Disney movies, like Little Miss Sunshine, Thank You for Smoking, Ed Wood. Spy They're Hard. Disney movies now. Spy Which one? Hard. Spy Hard with Leslie Nielsen. It lampoons the... It's really funny. <laughs> it's on there. Um, are you going to review I Care A Lot is the question. I'm sure the viewers want to know. Depending on what streaming service I have it on, I probably it is on Oh mine. yeah, I did say I did say I would review that, didn't I? Well, that's the question I have because I've watched and I want to know your thoughts. 
Well, in that case, I'll uh, I'll get on it. So I was like, huh, I wonder what Tyler thinks of this. Anyway, um, check out all the shows on Really Bad TV, Community Cast, all that jazz. Um, eventually, we'll have a new episode out. I've been very busy editing something very, very special, so I haven't had time to get a Really Bad TV episode out. But we're getting there. Um, all the scripts are on the floor right now, if you can't tell, because, yeah, you can't see my floor. Um, uh, yes, it is the thing you're thinking of, Tyler. Um, almost done. I'm on the big finale. I'm, re I'm editing that once we finish uh, recording this. So, um, Anyway, thanks for joining us on the Tyler and Josh Show, the Josh Tyler Show, whatever you'd like to call it. JT, you know, TJ, I don't know. Do you want to be? Uh, we have too many nicknames. Check out Tyler's channel. Check out his review. Check out the DuckTales upcoming video. We will put the link in the description to his channel there. If you have not seen our previous episodes, check those out. We have a lot of fun. Hopefully we get to bring Jenga back. It's hard to do it virtually, but you never know. Jenga movie questions is a good time. We will see you next time on the Josh and Tyler show. Tyler, say something awesome. Well, I'm not just going to say something awesome. I'm going to sing something awesome. Feel free to disagree with me on this one. <clears throat> The internet is for porn. The internet is for porn. Grab your dick and double click for porn, porn, porn. And we're demonetized. There we go. <laughs>